Number 7. The God of the Bible. Chapter 2. Continued. What's the problem? John Pauline. April 2020. Let us pray together. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to connect with the technology. Thank you for the reminders that we've had that the stories of the Old Testament teach us of your true nature and help us to trust you. And that the restoration of that friendship with you is the solution to the problem of sin. Help us to open our hearts and minds to your message today. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about the problem of sin and utilizing the more playful title of What's the Problem? What is the core issue in the universe? And we've been noticing a typology of sin or stages of sin, with the root being a distrust of God and then moving to suppressing truth, pride, ingratitude, a distorted thinking, rebellion, uh, and so forth. But there's one thing we haven't talked about yet, and that we get to with number six. So if you want to go to number six in your outline, you can see what the crucial text there it says, what are the ultimate results of the sin problem? In Romans 1, Paul talks about many, many consequences of sin in behavior, thinking, rebellion, etc. But here he gets to the ultimate consequence, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Very famous text, and we've all heard it many times before. But in this context, it's good to hear it again. Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have two options here, two outcomes. The one outcome is death, and that certainly would mean for those who are familiar with the book of Revelation, the concept of second death, final, total, irreversible separation from God. On the other hand, is eternal life, eternal death, eternal life. And notice the interesting thing. The eternal life is not described as the result of human behavior. Eternal life is simply a gift, the gift of God is eternal life. So the solution ultimately to the problem is not anything that we do. And that's why, as we will see in the third session coming up, we will see that the solution is trust. Trust is not a work. Trust is not something that we have to work up or do. But trust is simply allowing God. It's like an empty hand to receive the gift that God has there for us. So we see here the contrast between the two. Human beings, you see, have no life apart from God. It is God's life-giving glory that provides us with everything that we do have. And therefore, the path of Romans 1 is the ultimate foolishness. Because by suppressing the truth about God, by failing to trust in God, by having darkened minds and foolish actions, we are working against ourselves. We are undermining the absolute source of life. We're all created beings, and therefore it makes sense as created beings to know who we are and therefore to carefully follow what the Creator says. But you're not going to follow what the Creator says if you don't trust the Creator, if you don't believe that what the Creator is saying is the truth. It makes sense to listen carefully to the Creator. And how do we do that? That's where Scripture comes in. And in this whole series, we are seeking to dig deep into the scriptural text, the foundation text, seeking to understand that each step how the scripture lays things out to find that truthful foundation for our lives. This completes the stages of sin that we've been developing in this session. 
and I'll just go through them once more. First of all, the root is lack of trust, and lack of trust leads to suppressing the truth about God. Whether we're conscious of suppressing it or not, that is what we do when, when we lose trust in God. Suppressing the truth tends to have us ignore the good things that God has done. That leads to ingratitude. And ingratitude leads to pride. I find when I forget to thank God for all the good things in my life, that's when pride becomes an increasing issue. And pride leads to distorted thinking. Distorted thinking leads to believing in lies. Believing in lies leads to rebellion, and rebellion leads to death. Those are the stages of sin that we have seen in our study here so far. I see Gary. Do these have to be serial or can they be parallel? It seems to me that you can have some of these things before some others. So in my mind, this doesn't have to be strictly serial, but these things may be going on at the same time. Yeah, it's like kind of like science. In science, there's always a debate. Is this nature or is it nurture? Did you inherit it or did you pick it up from your parents or something along the way? And scientifically, when the debate is done and the research is in, the usual answer is yes. That I think it's helpful to see that in a logical sense, these build on one another. But in an experiential sense, I mean, we think back on Moses, in experiential sense, he went from distrust in God to rebellious action very quickly. And perhaps the staging of it may reflect more the initial development of sin. But in actual practice, I think sometimes it's sort of all of the above. So, yeah, good comment and I think helpful. All right, let's go on to number seven. It says, when speaking about trust and distrust, it's all about relationship. I think when it comes to sin, One of the crucial challenges is that do you speak of sin in terms of relationship? Or do you speak of sin in terms of, for example, broken laws and and things like that? And the Bible uses both ways of speaking. But behind the law is relationship. And I think Bob and perhaps Larry can speak to this. But the purpose of many laws is protecting people, protecting relationships. The purpose of the law is not to get people to focus on the law. The purpose of the law is to protect the relationships that underlie it. For example, marriage law, the purpose is to protect the relationship. The relationship is there not only because people feel like being married, but they're there because they have made a serious commitment to stay together. And that sees them through the dark times. So relationship, I think, is at the root of law. And yet sometimes when we talk about sin, we get all twisted up in talking about various legal ramifications, which can be helpful at times, but can cause us to lose sight of the very purpose of law, which is how we relate to God and how we relate to one another. Bob, you had more to say about that. One of the things in talking with some of the other lawyers, when one of our group, of course, Mike Bell, we've often talked about what is the purpose of the law. And one of the things he made a comment to me is the law doesn't always give absolute justice, but it's a way of trying to resolve a question on rights. It's a way of solving disputes because society has a goal of trying to find a way to move on and settle disputes. So sometimes you don't always get perfect justice, but it is supposed to have a way. It's in the interest of society not to have anarchy. And so you can't, for example, the bankruptcy laws are to give people a fresh start because if you had debtor's prisons like we used to have in ancient times, then people could never move beyond. And so society feels it's important to have a system for allowing relationships, in a sense, to continue and to not be violent, where you settle things with physical violence, things like that, there has to be a way of coming to at least a resolution. So I think that's another way of saying what you're saying. 
And I think law is probably not the best way to solve problems of relationship. If a married couple ends up in court, it's a very serious situation. But at the root of that serious situation is a relational issue. Now, just to throw that in, the law recognizes now what you're saying. And so at the beginning of every court case, there's a packet that has to be sent out nowadays. This didn't exist when I was a young lawyer, but it's called an ADR packet, which is Alternative Dispute Resolution. And it is the idea of forcing settlement conferences. In fact, there's some judges that will not allow a case to go to trial until the parties have sat down to try to work it out. That's becoming very common now. In some places, it's mandatory. Some places, it's not. But it's becoming more that way. And that's more law than you want to hear in this program. But that is along that idea. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're ultimately asking here, what is the problem in the universe? What is it that causes all of this disruption? And ultimately, that's not about law, because law addresses the more extreme issues. But the core comes back to this issue of trust and relationship. And that's the piece that sometimes gets forgotten. When Christians talk about sin, they're usually talking in terms of breaking laws in one way or another. But the root of sin is much deeper, and I think that's the purpose of this session, to dig into that. So it says, when speaking about trust and distrust, it's all about relationship. The purpose of the law is to safeguard relationship. How do the words of Jesus underline that idea? Matthew 22 and verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right. And then verse 40 said, all the law and prophets hang on these two commitments. Basically, Jesus is saying behind laws, behind Ten Commandments, behind all of these rules, that are stated frequently in Scripture as the underlying principle, love to God and love to one another. And when Jesus is pressed, in this case, which is the greatest commandment in the law, he doesn't go to commandment four, or he doesn't go to commandment five or commandment one, which some of us might have mentioned. Paul actually kind of goes to number 10, because number 10 is the one commandment that goes beyond simply actions and how you behave, it gets down to the root of covetousness, that behind infractions of the law ultimately is an attitude, ultimately is something deeper inside. So even within the Ten Commandments, you have that stated in the Tenth Commandment. But rather than pick any one of these, Jesus simply goes right to the root and says, that the first four commandments focus particularly on love for God, and the last six focus on love for one another, and that this is behind the root of all the law and the prophets. In other words, the entire Bible is ultimately centered on this issue of loving relationships. That can seem trite and trivial at times to people, but when you see the implications of not loving, the implications of not trusting. That's why this is session two and not session 12 or something like that. You have to establish what the problem is. And when you see how devastating the problem is, these small things like trust and relationship and so on turn out to be critical. They turn out to be foundational. So Jesus underlines the fact that it's all about trust and relationships, and that sin is about distrust in relationships. Okay, I see Bev. It occurs to me that this is why in our legal system very often we are disappointed that justice is not done, because the underlying elements of what Jesus said here is the underlying elements are love and trust, and we have unrealistic expectations of written law and codes. Mm -hmm. 
because they don't compel or they don't elicit trust and love. And mm -hmm. Jesus said this is the root of the relationship problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, law is not evil, even if lawyers are sometimes thought to be evil. But law is not the problem. Law is attempting to fix some of these extreme situations, but the root of the problem is how we relate to one another. Paul. I think the interesting thing is that law is added later. Adam and Eve didn't really even have a law, and sin was going to kill them. God said sin would kill them. He said you could eat from every tree. He said you must not eat from one, but he said you could. So it didn't even break a rule. There wasn't a rule to eat against the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He just said, if you do it, die and you will die. And when Jesus came and he was made to be sin, even though he was not sin, he died very quickly. First in Gethsemane, nearly died, and then on the cross before crucifixion could even kill him. And law is not a way that he could use to save himself. Law, according to Galatians, is just to allow you to see when you fail that you are sinful and that you will die unless you go to Jesus. So I think law is a distraction. It's a helpful thing for knowing that you have a problem. But sin itself is what kills you. Yeah, and the law can be a distraction. So that is true. It's not intended as a distraction. But again, we saw the subtleness of sin in earlier in the session, in which one of the subtle ways that sin attacks us is to take truth and good things and twist them until they become destructive. I think, Larry, you had your hand up? Something Bev mentioned about the justice. One of the things that deal only with God's love, if the focus is on love, in order to have restoration of relationship, if I've wronged you, the restoration of that relationship requires, number one, first of all, I don't do that again, so therefore, I have to be truly repetitive, and therefore, that begins the change in me to become responsible to our relationship. And then your part of that is to be loving and forgiving. And of course, if you're God, that's pretty easy because we know that's who you are. So there's always this tension that goes on between being loving and giving people a fresh start but the fresh start requires that you really do take a fresh start and not just pick up where you left off and continue going. Let's go to number eight in the outline. And it says here, how does God respond to the crisis of distrust in the universe? And that offers several texts in Romans for us to look at. So this is an introduction to things we'll go in deeper later on. But let's take a look at Romans 3 and verses 3 and 4. What if some were unfaithful? Will their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true, as it is written, so that you may be justified in your words and prevail in your judging. All right, so here we see a fascinating text that is often overlooked in many studies. But this is a text where, first of all, it asks the question, and it's kind of an odd question at first, it strikes us so. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? And here it brings out, I think, very, very clearly that God remains faithful. You know, his faithfulness is core to God's character, to who he is. God says something, uh, he does it. When he does something, he'll do it again. He's consistent and faithful. But then it goes on to say, no, let God be true and every man a liar, so you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. That's an interesting translation. Does anyone have a different one? I think Terry's was quite similar. Does anyone have a different one? Because I think in the original, in fact, I've got the original here, Romans 3, 3 and 4, it says, when you judge in the judgment of you. It's interesting. When you judge, and you judge in the judgment of you. In other words, 
this judgment is very, very likely a judgment of God, not God's judgment of us, but a judgment of God. So this is one of those texts that open up a window into another possibility that God's solution, God's response to the problem of sin is to open himself up to judgment. God would have every right to judge us, but in a sense, he doesn't need to. We judge ourselves by our behavior and by our actions. But God opens the book, so to speak, to his own actions. God's purpose in undoing the problem of trust in the universe is to be an open book and to allow the possibility for us to see truly who he is and reestablish trust. Go ahead, Terry. In my footnote there, it says, when you are being judged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a better translation. Daniel? It's a better translation, but still not the correct translation, because the Greek has a clear future tense. Okay. But because theologians don't have the drawer or the mindset for that, mm -hmm. so they translate it either the present or the past. But the Greek, it's future passive mm -hmm. tense, which is very interesting theologically that even from Paul's perspective, when he writes Romans in the first century, he says, you will prevail when you will be judged. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. uh, grammatically interesting is that the passive and medium are the same grammatical form but theologically it's important that the future is still in the judgment is still in the future and it's something that god brings he's not taken to the court but that's something that he does on his own so he will be judged oh, i appreciate that very much daniel good to have you with us in this process as i was just picking it up cold and looking closer at it i can see you're absolutely right and that is something that would be hard for most scholars to figure out what to do with. But it fits perfectly into this idea that if the core of sin is a lack of trust, and remember, this is still Romans. So Romans chapter 1 lies right behind this. Paul has already done this analysis of sin. And here's the problem of the whole situation. And now he begins to open his solution, has more to say about it later on in, in chapter 3. But he begins to open up by the solution is that I will take the seat of the one who is being judged. God reverses the whole thing. And this is a stunning thing. But we will see that unpack in more detail in session three and beyond. Larry. You passed through something very so quickly and lightly that is very, very heavy. And that's about the fact that we do the judging of ourselves. And I don't think today is the point to dwell on that. And I gather from what you just said is that we may be coming back to that in greater detail. I've only found that in Adventism when I talk to people. Every other religious group that I'm familiar with and talk to on any level of this, it's usually the judgment is something where God is doing the judging to us and of us. And so I'm hoping that as we develop this concept, you'll bring more into that into the future. But thank okay. you, because you just passed through that so quickly. It's like, anyway, thank you. Yes. Well, I think you see that particularly in the Gospel of John, to give a quick response to that. In the Gospel of John, one of the key words are judgment and witness. And both of those are words that can be related to the law court. And the issue in the Gospel of John was what people think of Jesus. So it's very similar to Romans 3 in that sense. The issue was you can say yes to Jesus or you can reject him. And in the Gospel of John, it lays out evidence of who Jesus is and then shows how Nicodemus, Samaritan woman, come to testify rightly about Jesus and others end up testifying not rightly, and you can see that development in there. And John goes on to bring out the idea that we are judged in terms of our own judgment, that in the judgment, God is not trying to trick us or undo anything we did in this life. We are simply judged in terms of how we judged ourselves, that in a real sense, we ourselves determine 
which side the judgment falls on in our case. It's not arbitrary action on God's part. So we'll hopefully get deeper into that at a later time. Dan, yes, go ahead. I think our discussion is really very pertinent, at least it is to me, because if one looks at today's culture, especially Western culture, I would say the vast majority of under 35 or for sure only 30 no longer believe even in the existence of God. So that I think that as they reject the idea of God, it doesn't mean that they aren't judging themselves. And it doesn't negate the fact that God is merciful and still trying to communicate with them. It is a strange time we live in where people, the vast majority of younger people, no longer even think about God. Yeah, I don't know about a vast majority, but it's certainly a much bigger population segment than we've been used to in previous generations. And I know my own children run into it on almost a daily basis, the discarding of all interest in God and in Scripture and so on. Yes, John? Where does revelation of God fit in with judgment? Because God has been unknown, not just to man, but to the universe. And his revelation during the cosmic conflict is surely part of that judgment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, coming back to the Gospel of John, the central theme of the Gospel of John is that Jesus is the one who came down from heaven to reveal what the Father is like, to reveal what God is like. And so this language of judgment and witness is closely tied in to all of that. Absolutely. I see a chat comment here we might want to bring in from Iris. It says, is Judas' suicide an illustration of the point, judging himself and not believing that there is room for God's grace? Very good point. I think that very well could be an illustration of this. All right. So you have a God who responds to the lack of trust in the universe by exposing himself even further. And of course, what God exposing himself to judgment is revelation. God is allowing himself to be revealed at a level that maybe most of us would not be comfortable with. Who would like to be a totally open book to the universe? I remember one time I was journaling, which is sort of like writing out prayers and things like that. We just sit down and write and sort of let the writing take its course. And I remember at one point thinking, what if I were to die tonight and everybody in the world gets to read this diary? And I began editing, you know, at that point. <laughs> you see, uh, who of us would really like to be totally exposed to the entire universe? And yet God is willing to do that to fix the problem. So the problem is extremely serious. If lack of trust is the problem, it's way more serious than most people realize. And that, I think, is the main point of this session. The Bible, then, is part of God's opening himself up to judgment. Do people judge God on the basis of what's in the Bible? All the time. And the judgments are not always positive ones. But in the Bible, God has laid out a record of his actions in relation to a wide variety of circumstances. And so in the Bible, we see a down payment, if you will, on that judgment of God that in the book of Romans is still in the future. But here we get to see how God behaves, how God responds to the problem of sin in a variety of different contexts. So the Bible is part of this whole picture. David, go ahead. Isn't the millennium a big part of God himself being judged? Isn't the millennium where we're going to get to ask all the questions and see for ourselves that all of God's actions were, in fact, in the best interest of everybody, and that there was no arbitrariness? The people who are there and the people who are not there are where they are because of their own choices and not because of an arbitrary decision on the part of God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we will get to a larger picture on that later on in the series. But what you're referring to, just without the evidence here, but just in broad sweep, sharing the picture, as I understand it right now, there is judgment going on. And again, this is judgment, first of all, the character of God. In other words, the 
unfallen beings, the angels who never fell, inhabitants of other planets, that's what this judgment is about. And they are getting a chance to see in detail how God handled every situation, not just those that are in the Bible, but every situation throughout eternity. And if in fact that judgment's been going on nearly 200 years, it's not surprising if that's the basis of it. If the judgment is God needing to determine whether or not we're safe to save, I think he can do that in an instant. But if that judgment has gone on for a lengthy period of time, it's because of something else. And the people in the universe who live in a clean and free universe need to know that the neighborhood isn't going to go when you and I show up. And they need to know that God is safe to trust. And so both of those are being established in the current judgment setting, where the unfallen people in the universe get to do this judging, both of God and also of us. After the second coming of Jesus, we understand there to be a millennium in which God's redeemed people from this earth, as you pointed out, get the chance to examine the same thing, examine God and examine others, but particularly God in that case, because we haven't had a chance to go through all the records the way they have. And we may wonder, why isn't mother there? Why is this guy here who did so many nasty things to me back and so on. There's going to be a lot of processing there of understanding, you know, why did God make the decisions that he made? And we'll be given the opportunity to dig deeply into that. And then finally, it's my understanding at the end of the millennium, a thousand years after the second coming of Jesus, there will be one other opportunity, and that will be those who have been judged unsafe to save. They too will get an opportunity to fully scope what God has done, fully understand, fully God fully exposing himself to even those hostile to him, that in the end, it says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We do not understand that to be a universal salvation, but we do understand universal recognition that if I'm not safe to save, it's not God's fault. It's based on decisions that I myself made. So that's sort of a nutshell picture of what Revelation has to say about the judgment. All right, looking over to Robson's. Revelation judgment is not just about God, it's also about Satan. Satan is exposed of who he is in the book of Revelation, and particularly in as time draws to an end, Satan will be exposed completely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a helpful comment, and we will have a lot more to say about that too. Yes. Thank you. All right. There's another text here, Romans 8, 3. In Romans 8 and verse 3, it says, what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Terry, why don't you go ahead and read that one? Your translation's a little different than the NIV. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay. And the language here is a bit difficult, so neither translation catches it perfectly. But I like the deal with sin a little bit better than what it says in the NIV here. But to make it simple, so that the different translations don't have to be a distraction, how does God deal with the problem of sin in the universe, with the problem of distrust? First of all, by opening himself up, which is what we've been talking about. Second of all, by sending Jesus. So that's what... Romans 8, 3 adds to this element. And one more text, Romans 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace that Paul's talking about is a present tense peace. It's the one that we can have now, but it's a down payment on the peace that comes for the whole universe down the line. So what God does to solve the problem of sin is, first of all, open himself up 
to the universe, to be an open book, to allow people to examine what he was done and to rekindle trust in the hearts of human beings. The second thing he did, which is really a parallel to opening himself up, is sending Jesus. That God himself came to us in a form that we could touch, that we could talk to, that we could listen to, that we could sit down and eat with, etc. So God has accommodated himself to the human condition as far as that is possible in order that we might clearly understand what God is like. So the end result of a restoration of that kind of trust would be peace throughout the universe. And we'll have a lot more to say about that further on. In fact, the solution to the problem of sin is the topic of the next session that is coming. All right, number nine in our outline. There are three main ways people describe the sin problem. Number one, we broke the rules and God is angry with us. Number two, we broke the rules and we're in serious legal trouble. Three, we've been deceived by Satan's lies, tried many substitutes for God, and the results have been disastrous. Which of those three fits with the analysis that we've been doing in this session? Numbers one through eight. Which of those three is the clearest or the best analysis of the scriptural evidence? Okay, Keith, Corbett. Well, the third one, simply stated, we've been deceived. And that's what the problem is. We've been deceived. And the only solution to that is the truth. Okay, the third one expresses that we've been deceived by Satan's lies, tried many substitutes for God. That's what Romans 1 in particular was all about, that as people turn away from God, as they suppress the truth, as they become prideful and ungrateful and so on, as their thinking becomes distorted, that is the root of all these things. And the solution then would be for God to reverse that problem. In Paul, we don't see the primary issue as breaking the rules, whether that's to make God angry or whether that's simply to put us in legal jeopardy. And when you read Romans in the context of the opening chapter, it seems clear that the problem is something that we have done, or the problem that is rooted in a lack of trust, and that therefore number three points us to the best definition of sin in this case. Julie. So I'm thinking about human relationships, and I've noticed over and over again, if somebody harms somebody else, the person who harms the other person tends to stop trusting the other person, which seems like the opposite of what you would expect. One time a lady asked me, because she had all these people telling her things about herself that I knew weren't true, and I said, I don't think you can really listen to those comments about yourself because those people now see you in that light because they did something to harm you and they kind of have to justify themselves mm. and kind of make you out to be a bad person, okay? So she said, well, how can I tell what my real problems are then? And I said, well, I guess if you see a fault in somebody else, that's probably your problem. And I think that is a human nature thing that we kind of do that. And I was just thinking how when somebody doesn't trust me, I stop trusting them because I think I'm pretty honest. And if they don't trust me, they must have an honesty problem. So what happens is I pull away and just subtly sometimes, and as it goes on, it becomes a vicious cycle because we both stop trusting each other. In God's case, he's completely trustworthy. We're completely untrustworthy. And yet he doesn't pull away from us. He comes to us. And it's mind boggling to think about it, but it's the only way to stop that cycle. Mm. I think that's a beautiful transition to draw a conclusion here, that in actual fact, what is happening is just as you described it, and that we have a God who, unlike us, remains faithful even in the spite of distrust. And it is us coming to understand that faithfulness that will be the beginning of a solution to the problems in the universe. Before we close, though, I see Robson's. It occurs to me that Paul is perhaps the best person that we know of in the Bible to tell us that sin is 
not about breaking the law because he was one of the best at keeping the law until he had his Damascus Road experience and then realized actually it wasn't that at all. Mm -hmm. Because when we focus on law keeping, we're not getting at the root. We're trying to solve the problem by brute force and by our own efforts. Very good. Yes, Daniel. And that's the problem with the second model. The first model says we have broken the rules. God is angry with us and thus we need to do something to change him. Now, how do you change God? I mean, we don't have the capacity for that. But the second model says, because we broke the rules, God is angry with us, but we are off the hook because he punished someone else. Now, the problem is, if you deal with the punishment, if you deal with the consequence, you are not dealing with the cause. And God needs to solve the problem of the universe, the cause of sin. And dealing with the consequence as you know from medicine or other things, dealing with symptoms is not treating the disease. You need to deal with a cause. And that's why the third model is the biblical model, because it deals with the cause of a deception about God's character. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good final statement, and let's move to a prayer. We thank you, Lord. It's in many ways a dark picture that we've been digging into here, but it's an important picture that we need to see clearly where the problem is so that we can appreciate the solution when it comes. And the question that we raise to you at this point is as we see the mess that we have gotten ourselves into, the question is, what is it that you really want? Do you want more effort? Do you want more focus? Do you want us to be like the mouse on the treadmill, just working so hard? What is it that you really want from us, Lord? And we pray that as we move on to the next session, that you will be with us to help uh, clarify the answer to that question and to draw toward the solution to the problem in the universe that you have laid out. We thank you for the word of God and pray that you would be with us until next time for Jesus' sake. Amen.